Hey, Faye. Hi, Viv. How's life in the city going? It's going great. So life update, I recently moved from Palo Alto to San Francisco. And exciting news for you, Viv, because I know you used to bike a lot. I recently started using Lyft bikes to get around the city. That's, that's super cool. What is a Lyft bike? Yeah, it's a bike share program. How it works is that there are bikes and bike racks littered throughout the city. I use a phone app to lock and unlock the bikes. And I can get around on bike without actually having to own and carry a bike. That's awesome. Yeah, that's all the, all the benefits and you don't necessarily have all the responsibility. Yeah, it's super convenient. And it's actually been a really fun way to just see the city. And also, it's probably a lot better for the environment than driving. Yeah, I think so. Or I've always assumed so. Yeah, I guess I'm not sure by how much, but it seems like a safe bet. Well, you know that I love data, so I think it would be cool to get some numbers. Yeah, and then if it is like a non-trivial amount better for everyone to be biking, then the next step is how do we get more people on the bike train? Yeah, that makes sense. Sort of like how to bike more safely or how to get better bike infrastructure. Let's talk to an expert who really understands this whole ecosystem. Hi, and welcome to the Keep It A Cool podcast. I'm Ife Huang. And I'm Vivian Patterson. In every episode, we surface stories about how individuals in our Bay Area communities are contributing to climate action. Today, we'll talk about biking. All right. I don't have any leaf blowers or anything else going on behind me, so I think we're ready to go. Any pets, Tim? Two dogs. You know, they could see a squirrel start barking at some point. (laughs) That's fine. That's Tim Wee. He works at the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition, or SVBC for short. They're a bike advocacy group that does anything and everything to encourage and support bikers in the Bay Area, from organizing bike safety classes to advising local legislators on improving bike policies and infrastructure. Me and Wendy, who is also on the Keeping It Cool podcast team, talked to Tim to learn more about it. Awesome. We're really excited to talk to you today. Ife unfortunately can't be here. Her flight got delayed. Coming from where? San Francisco to Reno, I think. I give her a hard time and say she should bike. (laughs) (laughs) We should suggest that to her. I think she might actually be interested. Uh, Would you like to introduce yourself, Tim? Sure. So um, my last name is pronounced we, like W-E-E, but spelled O-E-Y. Indonesian Chinese name with a Dutch spelling. And I've been biking since I was in first grade, I guess. That's where I learned um, just painfully on my own how to bike. I I was a chemistry major, but went into computer science for my career. And now... uh, Five years ago now? Wow. End of 2016, I decided to leave uh, high-tech uh, product development uh, where I worked for Apple, Adobe, and some other companies and do full-time environmental work, save our world from catastrophe because we have uh, climate change and actually a lot of other issues we need to solve. And bicycling is my favorite way for solving a lot of those. It actually, it just hits the ball out of the park in terms of what it can do for the environment, for your health, for our community, for economy, for everything. So that's why I work for the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. I have actually deep roots in the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition because I was one of the people who helped start it under its current name back in the 90s. And now it's um, a great thriving organization, although we still need more money, more members. Uh, People power and money power helps us get there faster, even on bikes. (laughs) And what's your current role with SVBC? I'm currently their event manager, but I'm tapped to do lots of different things. Since it's a small group, um, it's kind of like a startup. So I do some web work. I do some tech work. I'm also a a league cycling instructor. So I've done some classes for them, both online and in person. And instructing actually is what I enjoy doing the most. I like teaching people. That's awesome. There's like a lot to to dig in there. I guess the first question is... um, What sparked you to shift gears in 2016? Let's see. It was a sense of impending doom, but in a word, it was Trump. (laughs) He happened. I was like, oh my God, we really need to turn this around because we're headed in the drastically wrong direction. And although I had a great time in my tech career, 
I was uh, getting tired of it. I mean, I just had done it for about 30 years and decided I wanted to do something different and do more to save our world more directly. Were there any highlights on your journey between working in tech to SVBC? I did a, a ride across the country from San Francisco to Boston, giving talks about oceans, plastic, climate change, and kids. It was 97 days, 5,000 miles, and 254 talks. You only took 97 days? 97 days, 5,000 miles. That's and incredible. 254 talks was actually, it's hard to arrange that many talks in that <laughs> short amount of time. That's awesome. I think you mentioned earlier that biking can save the world, the climate, the economy, your own health, which, you know, the health part, I definitely see that. Can you elaborate a little bit on how it's important for climate change or do you know exactly how much of a difference it could make? So bicycling is essentially fossil fuel free. So even if you drive an electric car, you're actually still using a lot of fossil fuels because we use a lot of fossil fuels to mine all the ingredients going to an electric car. A bicycle is like 20, 30 pounds versus the cars are a couple tons of material. And that takes a lot of fossil fuels right now to mine that, to transport it, to manufacture it, to engineer it, and then to deliver it. Even if you have green electricity, it's still a huge amount of fossil fuels. To follow up on what Tim said, I did some research into the numbers uh, to really understand how much better in CO2 emissions bikes are compared to cars. Mm-hmm. So Vivian, okay. <laughs> so I'll talk about the numbers uh, in terms of first manufacturing costs and then operating costs. Okay. Uh, for manufacturing, bikes are on average about 95 kilograms of CO2 per bike. 95 kilograms. Yes. Do, do you know what that is? How many hamburgers is that? <laughs> That is a very good question. Uh, so, so a Big Mac is roughly four kilograms. So manufacturing a bike is equivalent to about 25 cheeseburgers. All right. Okay. That's, that's not bad. It's something you'll have for the rest of your life. So that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, e-bike is on the similar range. It's about 134 kilograms for an e-bike. Okay. So just a couple more Big Macs. Mm-hmm. Got it. Uh, now, guess what the carbon footprint is to manufacture a standard internal combustion engine car? Oh, boy. Um, let's see. It's maybe four times as much material. So 400 kilograms. Uh, you are How am I doing? You are off about one order of magnitude. <laughs> oh, no. no. <laughs> um, it is about 5.6 tons. So we're talking about wow. 5,600 okay. kilograms. Mm-hmm. 56. Wow, that is that is a lot. Yeah. Uh, and if you do the comparison, it's about 50 times more CO2 to manufacture a car than a bike. Wow. Also, what was I thinking? Four, yeah. four times a bike is definitely not a car. It's definitely more than that. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm never good at these estimates either. <laughs> All right, so now let's talk about operating costs. On mm-hmm. average, ICE internal combustion engine cars are 411 grams of CO2 per mile. Um, grams. Yeah. Okay. So, so not kilograms, grams, or 0.4 kilograms. That makes sense for a car, and I assume that bikes and e-bikes are basically zero operating yeah, costs. So this is the, actually the interesting part. Uh, oh. I, when I looked this up. Uh, People attributed about 25 grams per mile for operating a bike. Can you guess where the 25 grams comes from? This is not for e-bikes? It's just for bikes? I guess it's people powered? Exactly. Yeah. So those grams (laughs) of CO2, they come from your diet. Oh my gosh. Well, (laughs) in that case, we're crushing it since we're focused on eating a plant forward diet these days. So so actually how do e-bikes compare to a typical omnivore? So I didn't find numbers for uh, the people power aspect of an e-bike, mm. um, but usually the electric aspect of it, the cost of the electricity is roughly five to eight grams of CO2 per mile. So less than 10. Um, nice. So that's still 40 times less than 
a car per mile. Exactly. Or is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Math. Yeah. And that, I mean, also in California, we get two thirds of our electricity from renewable sources. So that's probably, you know, a lot less than that as well. Yeah. Awesome. We've got the production of the vehicle, then you've got fueling the vehicle, and then you've got maintenance of the vehicle, and then you've got building the big roads, which you need for electric cars for the vehicle. That's a huge, huge amount of fossil fuels and climate change, just from building all the road infrastructure and building all the parking you need. And bicycles are just so small and so efficient that in so many ways, this is a slam dunk for bicycling being so much better for climate change. Bicycling helps your health, so you don't have to invest in a health club and spend money there. You can just do your everyday business, go to the store, go to the shop, go to the library, go to work, and you get exercise automatically. And at the same time, you're getting all of that exercise and saving all the fossil fuel use. You save a lot of money. It's about a million dollars over your lifetime if you choose not to get a car. That's just per car in the United States. There's a million bucks. Wow. That's wow. a lot of money. You can retire way earlier. So if you choose to just have a bike instead of a car, you can save a lot of money. By biking, you are in the environment and you are in and participating in your community. You get to see other cyclists, say hi to them, say hi to people who are walking. In your car, that doesn't happen. You have a great appreciation for nature because you are in nature. You're part of it. You're out there living and experiencing it. Thinking about nature and being in it just helps people live more consciously and more thoughtfully in our world. Biking, it's, it's healthy, it's cheap, it's fun. You get uh, free drugs, as it were, because <laughs> you get endorphins and all of these chemicals that when you exercise, your body provides to you that make you feel great. Mm-hmm. And you get to eat whatever you want because you're burning the calories. So if you enjoy food, biking is wonderful. It's a long list of upsides. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's only a few of them. <laughs> I wonder, though, if, if you're somebody who is on the other side, who is a little skeptical, you know, can you talk through some of the challenges that Bay Area residents might feel that are preventing them from, from yes. taking this opportunity? And that's why I work for the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition, because there are challenges a lot of people see. When you're on the road with a car, it doesn't feel very safe because a car is you know, two tons of metal and plastic and glass that's roaring down the road. Whereas you're on a bicycle, you have no armor like the car. And the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition very much wants to have a safe space for everyone on the roadway, and especially, well, bicyclists. That's why the, we're the Bicycle Coalition. So the Bicycle Coalition works by our volunteers and doing advocacy work to persuade our local governments and corporations to encourage bicycling more give benefits to employees who bike to work, um, create safer spaces on roadways, which are the responsibility of governments, so that you have uh, protected bike ways and bike lanes that have barriers so that uh, cars can't go as easily into those areas. Or you just have a bike lane that's buffered to keep them, just with paints is uh, very good to keep cars away. So that bicyclists feel like they have a, a safe place to be when they are biking, separate from cars. And changing laws also to be more friendly for bicyclists. In a way, a lot of people are doing victim blaming when they say bicycling is dangerous. No, bicycling is super safe. Driving cars is dangerous. So the car drivers are the ones killing other people, not the bike riders. Yeah. So you work with uh, companies and governments. Do you also work with schools, educational institutions? Absolutely. Yes. Um, we, uh, Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition, does a number of safe routes to school program. Ideally, everyone is trained on how to ride a bike as a kid and how to ride it safely. Actually, this is my own personal opinion, not necessarily SUBC's opinion, but it would be great if we required everyone to have a bicycle license before they could get a driver's license, which is a little more typical in other countries. Mm, I didn't know that. So the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition really wants everyone to be very well educated. And so we have education programs for adults, for kids, for employers, and for shuttle bus drivers. We have driver training as well to educate everyone so that they're safer on the road. Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition was instrumental in a lot of the cities in the area adopting a Vision Zero Mm -hmm. goal in San Jose and Sunnyvale and the other cities in the area to reduce traffic fatalities and serious injuries to zero. That's what Vision Zero is about. That's really cool. I I haven't heard of that before. I guess on that note, there's a lot of infrastructure improvements that you can make. There's, you know, individual education and just kind of practicing 
do you think it will just take some critical mass for things to happen? Like, I'm imagining, like, if I'm trying to bike down El Camino, that's, like, deeply unsettling and uncomfortable because there's no bike lane. But if there was a large stream of bikers that, like, were there every morning taking up the right lane, then that kind of inspires change because it's clear that people want to bike down that road. But, like, how, yes. does, how do you get that started? Does it just take 10 people who are very brave to, like, go for it? So part of it is getting more people cycling. Part of it is making the laws more inviting and protect cyclists better and make sure that motorists pay attention, that they can't harass cyclists. And then infrastructure is really important. Um, the, those bike lanes I was mentioning earlier, so that people feel safe because there are no cars around. At the risk of going on a large tangent, do cyclists get harassed by motor vehicleists regularly? They do. Wow. Yes. Los Angeles and Sunnyvale have actually passed bicyclist anti-harassment laws. Sunnyvale is the first one in the Silicon Valley area to do it. We'd like to see more of those laws passed so that if a car driver is obviously way too close to a cyclist to intimidate them, or if they honk at the bicyclist, or if they yell at the bicyclist and threaten them, the bicyclist can file a lawsuit and actually get reimbursed. And the motorist pays the legal fees as well as the penalty. So what's the story of how that law got passed? Is there a particular champion of that that had a bad experience? In Sunnyvale, it was Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition and members of the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Commission at the time championed that and convinced the city council members to, to pass that particular law in Sunnyvale. It would be great if that was passed elsewhere. I do ride with video cameras on my bike so that I can report drivers who don't do the right thing. And some police departments are more amenable than others to accepting those police reports. But with um, the anti-harassment legislation, then I don't even have to bother going to the police. I can just like file a suit against them if, they, if something really egregious happens. And I have had, unfortunately, this happened in Santa Clara recently. I was on a street that was a special enforcement zone, 25 miles an hour. This car driver goes past me going faster than 25 miles an hour with inches to spare, honks at me when they had a whole other lane they could have pulled into. Oh. If they had done that in Sunnyvale, I could have mm. uh, pressed a lawsuit. Mm. In Santa Clara, I reported to the police and they did visit the person in question. They said, no, we didn't do anything wrong. The bicycle shouldn't have been there. I guess that's, <laughs> that's the attitude of people who are doing the harassing. Yep. <laughs> so. so we need a bunch more uh, Tims with videos uh, cycling around the streets. Right? Yeah, and, and there are a lot more. There's a growing set of people who are mounting video cameras on their bike as dash cams um, to make sure they capture this. Yeah. And there's a, there's a kind of a worldwide movement. Um, Whoa, that's so cool. I've never heard of that before. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great question, Viv. And I think it also reminds me of a time when I was on a bike and got harassed by a driver. So this woman honked at me, rolled down her window and yelled at me for not wearing a helmet. And that really put into perspective for me that drivers are probably really afraid, too, when they see a biker because drivers have the capacity to do real damage if they're not careful. Yeah, just elaborate on that. Like when you're on a bike and you do something unexpected, that definitely makes everyone in the area pause for a second to try to figure out what's going on. Yeah, exactly. But it's not only weird, unexpected behaviors. I think it could also be, for example, wearing bright, invisible colors. Right, yeah. So Tim actually gets into this and has some really useful tips for making sure that as a cyclist, you're doing everything in your power to be a respectful road user, like doing your part. So I was wondering if you could put on your educator hat for just a second and talk about that scenario of you being a biker next to the, the vehicular traffic. And what are like the top three tips that you give to a cyclist to tell them how to be safe in that situation? The top tip is to think and be like a motorist. If you're being a motorist, then you're taking the lane. The laws say that you're supposed to be as far to the right as practical, but that practical word is extremely important. So if there's a car parked in the far right lane, you can't be in that you know, far right lane because there's a car parked there. If the car is parked there, the door can open. Bicycles should ride at least five feet away from the side of a car that is parked. 
And so that usually means they should be right in the middle of a car lane when they're going past parked cars. So if there's not enough room for you to share a lane, then you should just be in the middle of that lane so that it's obvious to motorists that you're there. So the first thing is be like a motor vehicle, pretend you're a car, and then you'll be very safe because it just puts you right in front of other people. And motorists generally will not deliberately run over something that's directly in front of them because it's like right in front of their face. But they will try to squeeze by and think, oh, I can fit there. And then it's like, oh, that was just an accident for that crash. But if you're right in front of them, then it's obvious that they're at fault. Yeah, taking the whole lane, I think, is something that is, uh, it feels counterintuitive to me. But like you said, if you have claimed your space, then no one can try to push you out of it. Yeah, exactly. Right. You've just got to be confident and exude the aura of, I'm here and I know what I'm doing. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. Love it. What's the second tip? Be visible. I want to leave no excuse for someone not seeing me. So I am willing to wear like this really bright clothing. I usually wear a vest um, when I'm bike commuting. So I ride with bright colored yellow reflective stuff on me. You can't miss me. I'm like one of those people working on a highway. You can't miss them. And I'm trying to make sure I'm as visible as far away from them as possible. So they have a long advance notice that I'm there. Okay. So behave like a motor vehicle, be visible and comes back to being a motor vehicle. Just follow the normal traffic laws. Don't ride against traffic. That's actually the leading cause for cyclists. They're they're riding against traffic. They think it's safer because they they can see what's happening in front of them, but they're moving. They're moving like traffic. They're moving fast. So they surprise drivers. And that's where a bicyclist will get into a crash is because a driver's not expecting something that fast coming from the wrong direction. And then the uh, bicyclist can't see the traffic signals that are pointed in the direction, you know, that they need to be paying attention to. So um, those would be the top three things. Which are think like a motorist, be visible, and follow traffic laws. And there's a whole host of other things that I I teach. I'm a league cycling instructor with League of American Bicyclists, and they have a whole curriculum called Smart Cycling. And uh, Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition is now starting up an adult education program where the two of you can take uh, classes from us shortly. In the meantime, we do have online classes also that you can sign up. Go to our website, education page. Um, It's it's an online, uh, you know, just an hour education course. Um, it's best if you can do the education in person, actually exercise it and practice it. Um, just listening to something, yeah, you sort of get it, but until you actually do it yourself, it's harder to remember. And getting muscle memory is very helpful. Yeah. Do you, do you break it down into like, this is how you hand signal and this is how you stop Absolutely. at a light and all this stuff? Yep. Um, yeah, we go, th- um, typically the sequences, we do first a lecture and then we do some parking lot drills. It's typically an hour to two hours and then road riding. That's cool though. Cause then you get to immediately put what you learned into practice, which is exactly, exactly what you were saying. Exactly. It's very important to actually exercise and experience it and see what it's like. Actually getting more into the logistics side of things, I think another thing that really deters people is the perceived inconvenience. I think ah. you, you'll probably have some good ways yes. to get around this, but you know, there's, there's weather, there's topography, there's showing up to work sweaty, or, you know, if you're trying to carry your groceries home, if you're not equipped to do that, then maybe it's perceived as, as inconvenient. Um, I don't know if you have a rebuttal to that. Yeah, well, I've got a lot of different answers <laughs> for each of those points. So like carrying stuff, I've got baskets on my bike, so it's easy to carry stuff on my bike. They're just folding metal baskets and they each hold a grocery bag. So I can go to the grocery store shop and come back to my house faster on my bike than I can on my car. Because in my car, I've got to park the car, then go get a grocery cart and then roll it in, shop and then roll back, pack stuff back into my car and then drive home. With my bike, I roll my bike into the store, don't have to worry about parking it and use my bike as my shopping cart. Since it's about the same size as a shopping cart in a grocery store, I load it up, check stuff out, put it, put it back in bags in my bike, and then right out of the store and home. I've that never solves, thought of that. That's it so solves smart. a lot of problems because I don't have to worry about parking. I don't have to worry about theft. I don't have to worry about locking. Now, cars are traveling this big mass of metal, so they have this huge multi-ton security cage already built into their you know, vehicle. Bikes don't have that like my bike, I've got these video cameras, as I mentioned earlier. I've got my lights, I've got other things, my tools on my bike. And if I, if I lock it, then 
it takes me a long time to like take all the pieces off to make sure it's secure. But if I roll it in and use it in my shopping cart, then I saved all that time from the, the parking aspect. And I can just shop, pop in, pop out, and I'm home. We haven't normalized it yet of getting the bike in the store. But the thing is, you've got to make your bike functional in the store. So I use it again as my shopping cart. Maybe once every couple months, I really have to use a car for something like transporting other people that don't want a bike. Mm -hmm. But I carry everything by bike. And if you go to the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition, how to carry things page, you will see pictures of me carrying some things, other people carrying things. And I can carry more with my bicycle than either of you can likely carry with your cars. That is, that's a bold statement. Incredible. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Are you able to move 11 bikes with your motor vehicle? Oh, do you have like a tow system? <laughs> I've got a trail. I've got trailers. Oh, that's and amazing. Actually, I've, I've moved 11 bikes so far, but um, my capacity is probably about 20 bikes. I could probably move 20 bikes with uh, my bike trailers behind me, just with non-motorized legs, just my muscle power moving those bikes. As long as I don't have to go over a mountain, I have to go over <laughs> a big hill. Yeah, I wouldn't move that much mass because it's just too hard. But Silicon Valley is flat, big, wide roads, super easy, relatively smooth roads, too, overall. Yeah. Unfortunately, where I live and where Vivian lives is very hilly, but I will accept that most of Silicon Valley is is very flat. Yeah. Yeah. Did we take care of all the things that you mentioned, Vivian, in your list? I guess the other ones were weather, weather, topography. Let's talk about weather. So um, there is no bad weather, only bad clothing choices. So you can put on garments that will keep you warm and, you know, reasonably dry. And so I've ridden through everything. I've ridden through thunderstorms, which actually is one of the more dangerous things to ride through because of lightning. The rain itself, that's just inconvenient. But yeah, I've ridden, I've ridden in 45 mile an hour winds, which that's challenging. <laughs> but anything you can drive in, I can pretty much bike in. I haven't actually biked in a snowstorm quite yet. Just because it doesn't snow very much here. Yeah, we don't need need to worry about that problem. Yeah. (laughs) But Finns have great studded snow tires that they use, and they'll bike year-round in Finland. Wow. So, yeah, I just put on rain gear and bike in it. Now, um, arriving sweaty at work. So there are two tactics. One, I can just toodle along and just go slowly and not sweat much. Mm. Or if I do want to sweat, then I wear biking clothing while I'm on a longer ride. My commute to work is 11 to 12 miles. And sometimes I wear bike jerseys and bike clothing and I ride to work fast. And then I, I let myself cool down a little bit. Then I strip the bike clothing off and switch into work, like normal work clothing. And I may just do a quick armpit wash, you know, if I'm feeling smelly. And then um, I've actually tested this with uh, my colleagues and they said, yeah, you smell fine. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll switch back to my bike clothing for the ride home and take a shower when I get home. That's incredibly thoughtful of you to ask, yeah. just to make sure that, you know, the office environment is, is okay yes. with this. Who would have thought we would have gotten diverted in this direction? <laughs> yeah. So that's for the smelly aspect. So are you convinced yet? You're going to start biking more? <laughs> you know, I think that it's it's very doable. Where I live, there's like a nice bike trail near near us. So, I you know, that, that seems like a good place to start. Yeah. <laughs> So you just think about all the wins you get from doing the biking. So you get the exercise, you save the money, and you have fun while you're at it. You don't have to get mad by being in a traffic jam because a bicyclist pretty much never gets in a traffic jam because there's always a way around. They can get around anything. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned was with errands, how it is kind of annoying to have to lock up sometimes. But, you know, often you will have to, but there's no there's no place to do it because a store doesn't have a, a bike a rack ah. in front of the store. Do, do you guys work on that? Absolutely. There are programs in San Jose and Sunnyvale and some of the other cities where if the business needs a bike rack, they can get one for free installed by the city funded. Wow. Now, bike racks, I'm a little bit mixed on again because yeah, I have all these things on my bike, right? I'm a big fan of bike lockers and in particular, the bike link lockers are really awesome because they're self-balancing. You just get a little car and it's just a few pennies to park. So it's, it's quite inexpensive. And then you can just roll your bike in, don't have to take all the pieces off. But those bike link lockers discourage being abused because there's a time limit on them. You can't like be in there longer than a day or two. Is that what they have at Caltrain? Yes, they switched over. So Caltrain switched all their lockers over to the bike link lockers because they work so well. Also, they're stainless steel, they're weatherproof, and you put your bike into it, it can stay safe, out of the weather. Are there any resources that you could encourage 
landlords to install these kinds of lockers outside their apartments? That comes down to building codes and cities and governments again. Everyone's gotten their mindset, oh, we have to have a car parking space. You know, a car parking space in our area is around forty to $50,000 for one car parking space. Ooh. That's a lot of money. And you can just park a lot of bikes there. It's a much more efficient use of you know, land space to have bike parking. You can multi-level bike parking on it even. But yes, uh, governments not only can install bike racks after the fact, and they can have laws that encourage people to have um, bike racks, but um, when you build new buildings now, in California, the building codes are now requiring some level of bike parking. And they're reducing the requirement to have car parking so you can shift the cost and actually make it cheaper to build buildings. Because if you don't have to do all the car parking, you just saved a bunch of money. Is that something that individuals can get involved with? We kind of talked about city infrastructure before. It feels a little bit removed since it's from the government. But like, is there an easy way for people to get involved with legislation? Super, super easy. And something that everyone should do. You should not only meet your neighbors, you should meet your city council members. You should meet your elected representatives. so They know you, know what you want, know what your interests are, so they look out for you. You have a personal connection. Elected representatives, they're just trying to do their best to make sure their communities are better. So um, I have been in, involved with local government for quite a long time. Um, back in the 90s, I was on the Sunnyvale Bicycle Pedestrian Commission at the time when they first started up. And the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition at the time helped make that happen, in fact, that we had bike commissions in all these cities. They said, you know, we need to be looking out for bicyclists and pedestrians. So I, I was on the a BPAC then. I'm on two BPACs now. I'm on the Sunnyvale one again, uh, and I'm on the VTA Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee also. So people, citizens can talk to their commissioners and they can talk to their elected representatives, council members county supervisors, uh, state assemblymen, state senators, and, um, and our U.S. senators and uh, representatives. So to clarify, BPAC stands for Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Commission or Committee, and each city will usually have a committee of their own. And it's not actually limited to cities. If you're a jurisdiction or a county, you might also have a BPAC. For example, the Valley Transportation Authority has a BPAC of their own. That's awesome that BPAC can serve as this bridge between the communities and the city council members. Yeah. But I also don't want to forget SVBC's role in legislation as well. Over the past almost 50 years that they've been around, wow. SVBC uh, has helped pass a lot of really useful infrastructure projects from green bike paths in Sand Hill Road to, to helping to transform downtown San Jose. Uh, by building over 400 miles of bike paths. Wow. Mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot of SBBC's role in this is through building that community uh, because at the end of the day, the city's goal is not to just build more bike routes. It's to get more people on bikes. <laughs> right. Uh, so then it just becomes a one virtuous cycle. That sounds like a really good turn of events. Did <laughs> Did you say wheelie? What? No. <laughs> yes, I did. Oh, Vivian. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I'm almost 60 years old and I'm thinking about retirement now. So I'm uh, doing my last push to help save our world. I want to relax, retire and just enjoy my life. You know, go bike touring around the world is what I'd like to do. And when you're bike touring around the world, it's really hard to stay involved in a lot of stuff locally. Wow, that's exciting. I, I still picture you having those pulls, though. You're, you're probably going to get pulled back in at some point. Yeah, I will <laughs> always be an advocate at, at some level for bicycling and for zero waste. The younger generation, you're going to be facing some monster challenges ahead of you. Climate change is one of the first big ones. And it's, it's very urgent that we get people to think differently and shift over their modes. Our Earth is finite, and we're exceeding the resources it can provide. And we can be so much more efficient and so much more caring of our fellow citizens as well as the earth and our the wildlife, and the environment, if we just bike and just puts us in touch with people and with nature and saves money and our environment and our health. Well said, well said. Do you feel that the SVBC is making inroads with reaching younger people? Or are you reaching some success with bringing in the next generation of people? Um, we are to a degree. We have the Safe Routes to School programs. And there are a lot of climate activists out there. 
but we do not have enough members and we do not have enough funding to get as much done as we know that needs to get done. And that's one of the reasons I'm willing to do this podcast with you, because I'm hoping that you'll reach out to the younger generation and say, hey, you guys can have fun, save money, save the environment, do it all at once just by biking wherever you need to go for transportation. The, the biking community aspect of it is also, like you said, really, really important. You get to connect with a lot more people. And like a shout out to groups like Bike Party in San Jose. Have you ever done a bike party? I have not. It's a dance party on wheels. It is oh, a blast. <laughs> and so- um, When's their next event? <laughs> you know, it's a third Friday, I think, of every month. And you, you know, put fun things in your bike, light them up, you dress up according to the theme, and then go to a dance party. You, you start at one location, you bike to another location, they got music, you just dance. And then you bike to the next location and dance. You have music in between. That sounds super fun. Yeah. And it, it's a great time. And they've got them in the East Bay and they've got them in San Francisco. So that's bike party. Um, and Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition is having social rides, not heavy athletic style rides, but just rides that go around, see some interesting sites and talk to people. Just have a nice relaxing time. So all these local teams we're trying to form in all the different cities and they have different activities. So like Sunnyvale has some rides once a month. They have a bike repair event where people can get their bike fixed for free. That's really cool because as a beginner, like knowing where to ride or having new friends who like riding your bike or going to workshops that teach you how to maintain your bike, those all sound like they're lowering the barrier to entry, you know, giving you the experience that you need to keep doing it on your own. Yes. Or start a new bike community, you know? Or start a new bike community. So we'd like to have local teams connecting with people and getting young people and old people and multi-generational people all biking together and learning about each other and helping each other. So what would you like to see more of? Like, do you approve of bike shares and like lots of fleets of bicycles in the streets? Or, I mean, what what's the best way to get more bikes into the hands of more people? Or e-bikes? E-bikes are great. Yes, because they um, definitely make it easier for people to go further without sweating as much or get there a little faster. Um, still very safe compared to a car. It's a little more expensive, a little more technology, a few more things that can, you know, break down. But for people who are not as able, they can get there more quickly and easier. As far as say, getting more people riding or attracting more people, it's every angle. Just make sure they understand about the money saved and um getting more social, making more fun, making it safer. Uh, everyone has their own little set of concerns that they, we have to overcome to show them that, yes, it's not really that bad. And, and think differently and get used to some different things. You know, it's, it's okay to get wet. You go swimming, right? And that's kind of fun. You can <laughs> get wet on a bicycle, just wear clothes, have a change of clothes in a waterproof bag. Sorry, Wendy. I think you had also mentioned like bike share programs. Oh, bike share. That makes it more convenient for people bike share and scooter share so that you can take public transit and then not have to bring your bike with you necessarily and just pop on something to make that last mile or two to get to your destination. I am really happy that in the Bay Area, at least, so you can take your bike on BART, on Caltrain, on the bus. That extends the range of transit a lot. You can go much further biking than you can walking. What I'm learning from all this is that Tim does not discriminate against the type of bike. All bikes are good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but as long as it's a non-motorized bicycle. Yeah, or an e-bike, you know, electric cycles, I mean, but slower and more closer to nature. So you aren't ignoring nature and trying to roar by it. You're appreciating it and meeting people and interacting with them as well as nature. Wendy, do we have any other questions or lingering thoughts? For a little while in my household, we had three individuals in the household and seven bicycles. <laughs> it was kind of an interesting ratio. Oh my. Not enough bikes. <laughs> I've got 20 bikes. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, 20 bikes. You can learn more about SVBC at their website, bikesiliconvalley.org. They're also on Twitter at BikeSV and on Instagram at Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. SVBC is just one of many bike coalitions around the Bay Area, including Bike East Bay, San Francisco Bike Coalition, Marin Bike Coalition, Sonoma County Bike Coalition, and many more. Check our show notes for more great resources to better support bicycling in our communities. Thank you so much to Tim Lee from the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition for teaching us so much about bikes. Thank you to Stephanie Lai, who designed our logo, and Deep Talk for the original theme music. And lastly, this wouldn't be possible without our wonderful team at the Keeping It Cool podcast. 
That's Vivian Patterson, Wendy Cho, and me, Yifei Huang. Stay tuned for our next episode.